Welcome to the Exodus Cry podcast, where we have honest conversations around exploitation, trafficking, sexual culture, and justice. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Exodus Cry podcast. Uh, today, we're honored to have with us special guest Paris Borellis, who's an actress who starred in multiple Disney series. Um, she's also uh, starred as Alexa in the original Netflix series Alexa and Katie. Um, and she's also an influencer who has used her platform on Instagram and TikTok um, to raise awareness about the, the harms and reality of the commercial sex industry and exploitation and human trafficking. So we're really grateful to have her with us on the podcast today. Enjoy. So, yes, yeah, starting out, I would love just to hear a little bit of like your story for how you got interested in this issue of human trafficking and and what inspired you to start like wanting to make this like a an, an explicit part of your messaging and just raising awareness and all of that. My mom is from the Philippines and she moved to the States when she was 13 and she went back for like a year or so when she was like 16 or 17. And she told me all about trafficking because like she would see it, you know, through people that she knew. And um, she told me the story like when she was a teenager that she was with her friend and her friend basically tried to sell her for drugs. And that story just always like it just literally like seared into my brain and and then when I was a kid, they also had me watch the movie Taken, which is a very like movie like dramatized like version of it. Not that it can't happen that way, but watching that movie, like as a kid, I was like, oh my gosh, like I can't believe that this is real. Like I, like, I didn't even think that like there's a kind of evil like that that exists. Hmm. And then, so I knew all of that growing up. And then in 2020, everyone, you know, was home and I wasn't working and I was trying to find something to do. And I I hadn't really picked a cause that I wanted to use my platform to speak about yet. And I was thinking about it and I was like, oh, like human trafficking, like why, why don't I talk about that? So I basically just submerged myself in like information and research. And I was looking up so many different organizations like yours. Um, like Child Rescue Coalition, um, Not For Sale. And I was reaching out to everyone and just trying to be connected and be in touch. And I ended up meeting so many people and learning even more information than what I was already researching. Um, and I also noticed that on social media and in the world in general, human trafficking isn't really talked about. Mm -hmm. um, and I just wasn't, I was very confused why, because I was like, this is such an issue. And then I realized that not everyone knows how serious of an issue it is. Like I would talk to my friends about it and they would say, wait, human trafficking is still a thing. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, like it's, it's actually the worst it's ever been. Like, how do you not know that? And like, I was just so shocked by how many people just truly didn't know. So that's why I started talking about it on my social media. <laughs> I'm so glad that you did because like for us, 2020 was a really interesting year for us as well. It's when we were launching our uh, trafficking hub campaign. So our work in 2020, we had been going at that point for, oh, I want to say around 13 years or so. And we had, you know, like 20,000 followers on Instagram. Like our work was very under the radar. And uh, so we were doing like really good, important work. We were fighting on the front lines of human trafficking on a number in a number of different ways. But what 2020 brought the realization of is the power of people with influence using their voice to help support the effort to raise awareness, to shift mindsets, to educate the public. Right. And so I'm so glad that you <laughs> jumped on board with this because you've been a huge part of like helping to advocate for these really important campaigns that we've been doing mm -hmm. like trafficking like the trafficking hub campaign would not have been what it was unless you know people like you jumped in to really help support it so that was a game changer for us we went in 2020 from 20,000 followers to like 160 something thousand followers in just a matter of months yeah as that began to happen so there really is I'm just I'm I'm really grateful that you have found like kind of like your voice in in this 
space because there's so much value in like using it to to highlight this very important issue. So thank you for that. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, thank you guys. You guys are really doing like more of the work. But yeah, you, you, without you guys, then yeah. you know there wouldn't really be a conversation at all about trafficking. We were talking just kind of like before we got started about this idea for you. It was taken was that film that kind of marked you when you were younger. I had like a really similar experience watching a movie called The Accused when I was young, when I was 11, that really marked me for this injustice of men's violence against women. Mm -hmm. And specifically in, in the realm of sexual violence. And uh, whenever I have an opportunity to like tell my whole story, I always start there. I'm like, you know, when I was 11, I saw this movie called The Accused. It's about the gang rape of this woman and just kind of how that marked me. Um, then later, I was so not planning for doing this with my life. Like it was like fighting human trafficking. And, and, and I was trying to think about, man, I wonder if there's anything else in my life that like contributed to bringing me to this point where I'm actually giving my entire life to fighting human trafficking. And I was drawn back to that moment and I was like, whoa, that's so interesting that that was really like the first thing that just kind of marked me with this um, deep, deep haunting compassion and, and a real visceral sense of just how wrong and how awful the sexual violence is. And, um, and so I think the the energy that sustains me in this in the work that we're doing now a lot of i think even stems from that moment as a child so it's it's interesting mm -hmm. that you mentioned that could you elaborate more just even at that age how how you felt like that impacted you because i think it's i think it's just amazing the power of film yeah i think my parents made me watch it because they could see like this wild side in me and this like carefree side. And, and I feel like I'm still, you know, I'm that, that is still me, but I think they just saw it and they were like, and I'm also the first daughter. Mm -hmm. They had me when they were very young. So I think they were just trying to make sure that I knew like my environment and like the dangers that could be around me. Um, <clears throat> but I watched it and you know, it's the story about the daughter goes with her friend to Paris and the dad doesn't want her to, but the mom is like, they're fine. Like, they're grown up. Like, they're, they'll be safe. It's, you know, whatever. They're going to stay with family. And she gets there. She's like, oh, my family's actually not here. And she's like, okay. Um, but it kind of just, it just took such a simple idea going mm -hmm. on a trip with your friend mm -hmm. and, like, turning it into a nightmare. Yeah. And the parts of the film that I've, like really stuck to me was when Liam Neeson is like going through the brothels pretty much and seeing all of the girls on the bed. And like as a kid, I kind of was like, wait, like are they dead? Like how did right. they die? Like what happened? And I had to realize like, oh my gosh, like they're like being drugged and they're ODing and then they're yeah. just left there. Yeah, And like, like 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 garbage like not even like a like like it's not even like a real person it's just like literal garbage that someone just like left on the street and in my head i'm like wow like this this actually does happen i can't believe that this happens like i can't believe like my mom's friend tried to sell her for drugs like what like what if like what what happened what if she didn't get away like you know and like all of these questions are circling and then it didn't make me scared to travel i love traveling but it just made me way more aware of everything around me and being more mindful or like, you know, if there's like an energy that I feel to like look and be like, okay, like what is that? Um, but yeah, I think that movie, it, it, it just does such a good job of like, you know, making it, it, it does a good job in the sense of making it an action film so it's like entertaining for an audience and it like keeps them watching it. Mm -hmm. But then also to discuss an issue that's really hard and difficult to talk about. So it's like people are still entertained by a movie, 
but they s still get the information to the back of their head that's like, oh, this is a real thing. You totally. Know? And I, I, I love that your parents felt like that was the best way they could help kind of create this this awareness or this worldview yeah for it you. gave me like a vision it like it gave me like something to look at you know because yeah. you can tell someone a million things but i mean especially me because i'm like a visual learner like yeah i can i can hear all the stories that like my mom could tell me or like you can hear from your parents like hey don't do this or hey don't do this and like when you're a kid you're like no it's fine the world's great blah, blah, <laughs> yeah, blah, yeah. Blah, blah, you know? yeah, totally. but like you know seeing it visually i was like oh okay got it this is how it is like this is this is real <laughs> yeah no yeah. that's that's powerful and that's i mean a big part of the reason why we're doing the films that we are too because i get calls from parents that who are panicked because their child has just been exposed to porn or mm -hmm. you know some some scenario has happened and uh and and are just sort of like n not knowing even how to have a conversation, that conversation about it. with their kids. I think a lot of parents feel stuck in that they don't understand the issues deep enough. They're aware this is wrong or this is dangerous or this is, you know, violent or awful or this could, you know, jeopardize my child, but they don't they don't know much other than that. And that so like having a conversation about it feels almost a bit threatening. Like I I don't know how to properly discuss this. So I think that's a great example of like the power of film mm -hmm. where you know, I mean, clearly the people who are making it probably weren't thinking, oh, we're making this as a educational resource for parents to use to scare their kids. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, 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 but that it, it is being used that it is, way. It is used as that, yeah. <laughs> and it made me ask a lot of questions after watching it. It's like the same way that my, my sisters will ask me questions. Like when I'm posting about something on my social media or like if I'm having some kind of like seminar Zoom thing, like they'll, I like that they ask me questions or they ask my mom questions. So mm -hmm. it's like kind of still like sparking a conversation for them. And then it's like, it's nice to kind of be in a place because I have educated myself yeah. to be able to answer questions properly and as normal as I can without it like, being too scary sure yeah you know? because yeah. i feel like there is like a balance because like i feel like if you just kind of throw it into somebody to scare them sometimes it's just rejected and it's like all right that's a lot i'm gonna i'm <laughs> yeah, gonna yeah. it literally can just go out the other ear so the past couple years i've been trying to find a balance of it because when i started i was like not that i'm not passionate anymore but i was like it was like literally taking over my day and it was taking over everything that I had because I also I wasn't working at the time there was and I love that by the way I'm just gonna throw that in there <laughs> I love that I, it was literally <laughs> taking over every part of me and I was throwing it into people and I was like listen to me hear me like you know like like there's an issue we got to solve it and then you're a convert yeah you're, you're an abolitionist and then at a certain point, I realized like, okay, not everyone is going to be as passionate as I am. So I need to figure out how to serve the information in a way that they're actually going to resonate with it and understand. Yeah. So I had to like kind of back up a little bit and like look at myself and be like, all right, we know how you feel. Relax. Not everyone is going to feel that way. So be a little more balanced about it when you're talking to people about it. Cause I, cause then I would make people feel weird and like, you know, <laughs> yeah, no, no, <laughs> you yeah. know, and it, that's not, that's then that's like the opposite of what I'm trying to do. Yeah, so totally. Yeah. It's like a, but it's a hard thing to do. It's a hard like topic. You know, it's a hard thing to talk about. So it's, it's clearly, it's like touched you like deeply. Yeah. I, I'm curious just in your own experience, cause you're not, na you're navigating like a pretty interesting world living in LA, being in the film industry and then traveling a lot as well. Uh, and having social media. Yeah, being very like active the internet. <laughs> on social media, having a lot of visibility. I'm curious how, like, having a, a, a deeper understanding and a more personal connection to this issue has maybe, like, given you a lens or a filter or a worldview that, that has helped you in practical ways. Just purely curious, like, are there situations where that you have found yourself in or people that you know where you're like, this doesn't feel right 
Uh, I have in a couple nail salons. Mm-hmm. Um, I've like felt something weird or seen something that just didn't seem right. Mm-hmm. Um, and I have like reported it. Um, when I go into airports, I really look around at everything and everyone. Um, like there are times when I see a kid, you know, by themselves and I'm literally watching and I'm like, okay, what's happening? Like, where are you? Like, do you mm-hmm. know where you are? Do they look lost? Do they look uncomfortable? Like, and then I, then they go to their parents and I'm like, okay, like parents are there. Great. But I guess it, it made, it just made me super aware of everything. Um, because I think that's also part of the issue is people don't know what the signs are. And I always kind of like have my checklist of like, okay, do they look uncomfortable? Do they look lost? Um, do they look like they don't know the person that they're with? You know, like you just kind of go through like all those questions in your head. But I like I want more people to be aware of it because the more people that are aware, the more reports you can get and therefore the less trafficking we have. Well, imagine to be in that situation if you're the person being trafficked mm-hmm. and you're in an airport, you're at a restaurant, whatever, with your trafficker and like nobody sees you. Yeah. And you and there's this cry inside of you. Like there the, I in the in the early days for me when I was first combating this this girl had this dream and uh, a a trafficking victim walked up to me and handed me a note and and it was written in large font help me uh in the dream and for me it was like a window into the cry that is in a lot of these people's hearts but are silenced like she slipped me a note in the dream Mm -hmm. and i just think how a lot of these people so there was this one situation where i was in moldova which is like ground zero. At one point, it was like ground zero for for trafficking in Europe. They were just taking so many girls from Moldova and mm. and then exporting them to other places in Western Europe and Dubai and Turkey and places like that. But um, I was in the airport. Now I'm at this point. I'm doing this. Like I'm I'm literally there filming a documentary on trafficking. I'm in the airport and we at this particular airport that we were in this like one smaller terminal just waiting for like a smaller commuter plane to get to a major city to then da 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 so there wasn't that many people and there was a young woman and an older man sitting together and it haunts me to this day like i i look at them and i just knew i'm like this is did not Something, right yeah yeah mm-hmm. she she had all like the visible signs of like like I am not okay, and this man <laughs> looked the same way in a different way, mm-hmm. and 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 I just felt myself stuck. I'm like, well, I start to rationalize. I'm like, well, it could just be an older guy with a younger girl, and like, and and I'm like, I know. I'm like, no. And then I'm like, well, what am I gonna do? Like, what am I gonna say? Like, so I'm going through this. I end up doing nothing. And to this day, it haunts me. So now I feel like I'm oversensitive. <laughs> like we were just yeah. actually at Whole Foods recently and I there's an outdoor patio area past this girl walking out. And I told these guys, I was like, we got back to the car. I'm like, I think something might be wrong with that girl. So I went back to go talk to her and then her friend was with her and like they were eating or whatever. And I was like, okay, well, I guess that's fine. But now I find yeah. myself like a little oversensitive, like willing to like go up to people and be like, are you being trafficked? They're like, bro, I'm just like hanging out I'm just the eating park. a sandwich. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, at least like because of that experience, like you, now you will always say something if you get like even a slight feeling. And if it's not the case, then okay, that's good. But then if it is, then like you, you have that power and like that hunger and like not that you didn't before but like it's even more on overdrive because of what happened in the past totally um other ways that it affects like my practical life um like social media my sisters they all have phones and i'm always like what are you on like like who's on your friend list like what is like do you know all these people like it makes me very aware of like what they're doing on their phones Mm. and then even like my we were at a friend's house and i was with my sisters it was their friend 
And my sister was like, we're going to go out and walk around the park. And I'm like, what do you mean? No, you're not. She was like, yeah. And she was like, and then I was like, mom, no, they're not going out by themselves. Like we're in like, I know that we're not in like a bad area, but no, they're not freaking walking to the park. They got to go across a freeway on a bridge and like into a park that I don't even, I don't even know that park. And they're like, I'm like, no, you're not going. Yeah. And they were like, why? I'm like, because like, do you know what trafficking is? <laughs> and they were like, oh, okay. <laughs> it's like, yeah, you're not going by yourself. Like if you want, I'll go with you in a little bit. But like, I'm not going to go with you right now. But no, you're not going to walk there by yourself with your friend. Like, no, you don't do that. Totally. Um, and it's not it's not like living in fear. It's it's more just like being wise. Like, because mm -hmm. I, what I hear you saying is like, hey, yeah, let's go to the park, but with a few other people. And you've mentioned that about some of your travels as well. Like just wanting to be wise about, okay, how do we navigate this? It's just having that awareness that the potential for this is out there. That was something that didn't exist before and a lot of traffickers took advantage of that. They're getting more sophisticated in their approach, especially on social media and stuff. Mm -hmm. on every, like everything became virtual and that was like, one big thing I learned with COVID is literally everything became virtual because everyone was mostly locked up. Yep. So now everyone's trading and buying and selling and it's like a production now, but it's like all online. So now there's like a whole nother world that like we don't even fully understand yet or have like the data to talk about the statistics of like how bad it is. Yeah, <laughs> Cause totally. we have no idea because it's still so new. It's only been like three years since COVID happened, but that's like a whole nother realm of who knows, you it know? Is. There's uh, an organization called Shared Hope that, uh, quotes this pimp as saying um and I'm, I'm this is a paraphrase of what he said but it's pretty it's pretty spot on he's like these girls have no hope against a guy like me because i eat sleep drink j dream think of ways to trick them into doing what i want them to do so even just for me like when i get like reports of my screen time i'm i'm like Nah, I didn't spend that much yeah, time. Right? I'm like, I'm spending like a good portion of my life online now. And it's it's kind of a weird realization because you don't really think of it that way that we sort of have entered this metaverse. Like we we spend a lot of time like online. I put timers on my apps. So it's like one hour on Instagram, one hour on TikTok. My email, I can't put a time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, those things like that, I'm like, okay, you know, I need that. That's my work. But um, yeah, my social media apps, they all have timers. Mm -hmm. And it's helped so much. Wow. So much. Like it basically gives me time because social media is also part of my work. It's also part of my job. So it literally gives me time to create whatever content I need to create, draft it, maybe scroll for a little bit, and then I'm out. That's really helpful. Yeah. I think I need that. Yeah, just go on, it's so easy. Just go into your settings and put an hour, you know, yeah. like, or however long you want it to be. But yeah, you okay. just do it in your settings. I didn't even know you can do that. I'm very unsophisticated with my use. I just like <laughs> find myself like on there not knowing what I'm doing. Have timers, they exist. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. That's great. But these guys get on there and like now, especially with things you know, so there's there's like the real predatory aspects of the sex industry, whether it be pimps or traffickers, or now with the added complexity of OnlyFans operating as a multi-level kind of like marketing system where there's this kind of recruitment model where people get rewarded for recruiting others into it. Mm -hmm. So I'm just thinking of being like, you know, for, for young females coming of age in this culture now, you went from a being a child to suddenly you find yourself in this world where there are literal predators using all these different avenues to try to reach you and it's all baiting them. It's not, they don't come out with horns saying, I'm a trafficker, like I'm yeah. here to get you, you know, it's, but they're spinning webs, they're, they're laying bait, they're putting traps. And, uh, and you know, I had some of these conversations with my daughter and she's, she's like, um, just can't wrap her mind around it. And I'm like, 
listen, you don't understand some of these things, mm -hmm. but just trust me, I do. Yeah. I'm trying to keep them as much as I can in the dark about the fullness of what I do because I'm like, I'm just not ready to disrupt the utopia of their childhood yeah. at this point. Yeah. But I'm like, just trust me. And like, it's, it's, uh, yeah, you just don't grow up thinking like, oh, there's a trafficker lurking behind every corner. Like, but the reality is, is that it's on your phone now. Yeah. They're in your home. They're like literally in your home now, you know, because of like internet oh, and social man, that's media. A, such a yeah, it's, weird way to think about it. It's yeah. that invasive. It's in your home. Yeah. Because they're not, they are on the street somewhere, but like they're literally in your home because of like your phone and your computer and your TV and your Alexa and all that, you know, it's like, it's all information, you know, but Ooh. I think I got that from um, Law and Order SVU. It's when... I can't remember his name. It's the main guy. Um, it's his daughter. It's like, this is like one of the earlier seasons when like the internet is new. And he's talking to his daughter about email and the internet. And she's like, she's like, I don't like, I don't get why you don't trust me. And she's, and he's like, no, I do trust you. But you know how I, I trust other people. <laughs> yeah. But he they worded it so well because he was like, you know how I have locks on the door to keep the bad guys out? Well, now they're inside on the computer. So I have to put locks in the computer to s protect you from those guys coming up from the screen. And I was like, oh, like That's a helpful way to explain. it. Yeah. And that yeah. was like. 20 years ago now i think you know when that episode maybe came out yeah how much more yeah <laughs> now is that relevant though you know right i had this mom call me this was such a scary situation so there was this mom she was in texas she called and uh have you studied attachment theory much attachment theory yeah it's, um, it's maybe but i just maybe i haven't like heard the it's like a a theory to describe um, how you attach to other people and how relationships work. So some people are like an avoidant attachment and some people have an anxious attachment. Anyway, I, I found it to be helpful. But in this particular situation, I realized the power of attachment in the process of a trafficker, pimp, predator, luring a young woman. Because what's interesting about it is, is is what they're trying to do is basically basically establish the attachment. Mm -hmm. If they can create the attachment, everything else sort of takes care of itself. And that's like really scary. So what happened is is this this person, you know, living in Texas, raising their daughter in a, you know, like normal, both parents in the home, uh, pretty conservative values-based environment raise raise their daughter for all intents and no. purposes just like a normal healthy good family this pimp trafficker figure guy starts making connection with the daughter when she's like 16 17 the parents don't even know yeah and he's being very intentional about creating this attachment through the the premise the idea that there's kind of some romantic you know relationship that's budding here mm -hmm. so this attachment is formed she falls in love with him he pretends to fall in love with her whatever that is when she turns 18 she goes to visit him and then disappears and the mom finds out that she's being prostituted out in strip clubs and all these different places. And, but the difficulty at that point was getting her back. Yep. Because, because the attachment. So it's mm. not as simple as let's go he rescue loves me. her. He's going to marry right? me. He's, mm -hmm. He just needs me to, you know, sell my body to these people because he's struggling with his, be with, he's struggling with his bills while he pursues this, you know, rap career or whatever entrepreneurial thing that he's doing. And, uh, so a lot of these like cover narratives are used to rationalize and justify what he needs her to do for him mm -hmm. once that attachment has been made. But the scary thing of that whole situation was just that um, you, it wasn't an issue of just rescuing her. It was that heart level attachment. And 
I, I mean, I felt the powerlessness that the mom felt in that situation. And I felt um, so much compassion for her. I'm like, this person infiltrated your home to use your language, you know, in that sense, like they essentially infiltrated your home without you knowing it and, and, and set a hook in your daughter that now is going to make it extremely difficult to get her out of that situation. Yeah. Cause I think of like how hard it is when you're a teenager and you know, it's that classic, pretty much everyone goes through it where, you know, your daughter, or your son dates a, dates somebody and like no one likes them, but like you can't do anything about it because they're in love with them and they write it out for however many years. And then they eventually break up and they're like, Oh yeah. Like I see what you guys were saying before, but like, that's such a that's such an innocent version, but like you can see on that level how hard it is to break someone's connection to somebody when they're in love with them, when they're totally. 15, 16, 17, or even in their 20s or 30s, like anybody, like it's hard to break that connection. So when you're that young and then you're dealing with an evil person who, because they also know how to like, they know like what your weaknesses are and they know where you're vulnerable in life. So they use that to give you something that you've been like looking for, but they're able to find it so easily. I don't know how, but like, yeah. but like they are. So it's like, you're so young, you have an evil person, like, and trying to break that, it's, it's, it's times a million. It's like not even the same sport, but like, you know, just in general, when people fall in love, it's hard to break that attachment and that connection. Totally. So I can't, yeah, I I can't imagine how it would be for a parent, like knowing what's happening yeah. and, and then not, not being, being able, able to, to do it. anything. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's, and, and just add on the layers of the different vulnerabilities because in that situation, this girl was not somebody who was predisposed towards trafficking in any kind of way the way that others might be from mm -hmm. the standpoint just looking at it from the standpoint of vulnerability like if you have a prior history of sexual abuse if you're homeless you know there's a number of factors involved that would make somebody like more vulnerable or predisposed towards being preyed upon to be brought into the sex industry to be used and consumed and sold and all of that and so and so that story is interesting to me because it was like she was the least likely candidate, mm -hmm. but, you know, backing out of her situation going, okay, now if let's say that, that young woman didn't have a dad and was maybe more like craving love or in Moldova where I talked about earlier, where they will come when the girls around 14, 15 to the orphanages and bring gifts and start trying to establish a relationship knowing that they're going to age out at 16 or 17. So when that girl ages out at 16, 17, she has nowhere to go, right? She has one connection to the outside world. It's this guy who now she trusts, who she's hoping is going to be a romantic relationship for her. I mean, it's just, it's... Or someone just to take care of her. Right, yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and so preying on those vulnerabilities. So looking at this demographic of young women coming of age in our culture, the way that they are being commodified in the sex industry, the, on the, from the seller side going, you know, the motivation of I can make so much X amount of money on this. And then what vulnerabilities exist there? It could be the girl. It could know, be insecure. It could be, you know, uh, there's so many different things. So many factors. Be. But, and they know it. I don't know how, but they know. It's like, they're just, I mean, that's like a psychopath though, is like they're able to see like exactly what you need, you know, or what you're missing or like what you're like wanting or anything. Like, And I, it's like, it's crazy, the psychology behind it. Totally. Yeah. When you really get into that, and I'm not like a, I'm, you know, I'm like a pseudo psychologist. Like, I think you kind of like have to be if you're going to do this because just trying to deconstruct what's happening. I've been thinking about taking psychology just so I can have the background information because, you know, I read a lot of stuff all the time and I, I still like scratch my head a little bit, you know. And so I've thought about taking like a college course at like a community college for psychology just so I can have like a base of information to like go off of.
It would be helpful just to, you know, understand in a deeper way. I'm always trying to learn things from the psychologists that I connect with. Um, it's, I don't want to use the word fascinating. It's just, it's, it's interesting to think into the different mentalities that are at work behind the buyer, the seller, the one being sold and, and, you know, what, what is causing all this to happen? So, and I think there's some kind of unique challenge to the culture that we now live in being such an image-based culture and the kind of unintended consequence of that just creating insecurity in, in, in girls that was maybe in young women and young people in general in a way that was maybe there before just by virtue of that age, but now is amplified because of what they see. Totally. You know, like I tell my sisters all the time, I'm like, everything's edited, everything's face tuned, everything's airbrushed. People don't actually look like that. And then when I post my photos on social media, like I won't say that I never edit a pimple out or something, but like I'm not wearing makeup right now because I'm just like, this is this is who I am. This is how yeah. it is. And yeah. I really try to be as natural as possible on my social media with the exception of doing photo shoots and whatever mm -hmm. else that I have to be made up for in my career. But I tell them all the time, I'm like, it's that's not how it actually looks. Like people have pimples, we have texture, we have acne, we have stretch marks, we have this, we have that. Like, you know, like whatever you see online is not always true. So like, don't compare yourself to that because it's probably not real. <laughs> yeah, know? that's good. And because I struggled with that when I was a teenager because I really became a teenager when social media started popping off. Like I was, I have like my Instagram has all of the original Instagram filters on it, you know, like way at the bottom because that's, that was my time is when all mm -hmm. of that stuff was coming up. So going growing up as a teenager i kept seeing things online and it just made me compare all the time and it made me so insecure whether it was like how somebody looked or like the success you know i would see someone thriving and so successful or they're traveling to all these beautiful places and i would be like oh like i'm not there in my life yet why am i not doing that and i'm like oh it's because i'm 16 and i'm not supposed to be <laughs> oh there gosh. yet like yeah, these are yeah. like you know one percent of people that are doing that at that age um but it would make me compare and it would make me insecure. Um, so then I had to, you know, try to move on from that and stop it or like, yeah, I don't, I don't really know how I did it, but like, I guess like doing like therapy and then just trying to remind myself every day, like, it's not like, it's not always real. Like it's not always real. Like stop comparing yourself. Like, and then also trying to understand like why are you posting a photo like what like what is your intention when posting a photo like mm -hmm. that sounds so serious but it's true like why are you doing it is it so other people like it is it to be artsy is it because you embrace your beautifulness or sexiness is it or is it just to get you know comments from people or is it to make someone else jealous like why are you why are you posting and i like having thinking of like that even like now as like more of an adult, I'm like, I still have to think of that. Like, why yeah. am I posting this? Why am I doing it? Like, cause I don't know. It's just something that kind of like never really goes away. You but know, it's hard to have that kind of an objective analysis when, when you're young and when you're surrounded by it, you know? And I, I think your sisters are, you know, they're um, at an advantage for having an older somebody sister, like you, an older sister who's yeah. kind of been through that and helping because I didn't have that because yeah. I am the oldest and yeah. my parents didn't have social media growing up, you know, for the generation before me, it was like magazines, you know, like every magazine cover, you know, a girl would be like, you know, stick thin. And that was always the comparison. Those were the beauty standards. And mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but now it's like social media and it's like there's so many different things. There's so many different trends like on what people think is beautiful. So I didn't have someone to tell me what I know now, because also all of my friends were also going through it with me. This was so new to us and we were all experiencing different things with social media. So yeah, with my sisters, I, I it is nice that I'm able to be like, hey, here's this, here's that. Like, hey, you know, maybe don't spend too much time on the you know? <laughs> In just a few decades, porn has invaded the screens of nearly every household with an internet connection. But few people know the truth about the multi-billion dollar industry behind this content. 
Action. Our documentary miniseries Beyond Fantasy rips the mask off of the porn industry. It takes viewers straight into the belly of the beast and brings them face to face with some of the biggest porn producers and performers as they describe, in their own words, an industry that profits from ethical violation, coercion and abuse. The chances, the risks that they take are the deal that they make with the devil when they come into this business. It's a hard-hitting series that exposes the porn industry like no other film, but keep in mind that it does include the use of blurred porn video clips, so we encourage viewer discretion. You can watch the Beyond Fantasy series for free on YouTube or at beyondfantasy.com. Did you grow up in LA? I know you mentioned that your mom is from the Philippines. Mm -hmm. Yeah, did you grow up in LA or were you also did you also spend time in the Philippines half and half so I we're actually I'm actually from Wisconsin oh oh, my okay. mom ended up in Wisconsin where because in Wisconsin Milwaukee Milwaukee okay yeah my dad is from Milwaukee so she met my dad in Wisconsin and um my grandpa he was in the Navy and he's from Wisconsin so that's how they ended up in Wisconsin okay um and then she met my dad and then there came me and you know um but I lived in Wisconsin until I was 14 then I've lived here for 10 years. So yeah, because I'm 24 now. So I literally hit 10 years of like living out here. So it's like half and half. Like I have like, you know, core values that are from Wisconsin. And but then I also did partially grow up here because I was I was, I was 14 to 24. Like those are pretty informative years, like being a teenager and then turning yeah, into a, yeah, yeah. an adult and then now being a, like where I am now at 24, which is like I still don't really think it's like fully an adult, yet, <laughs> but it's like more of an adult than like being 18. Um, so I have things that I've learned here. So like it's it's kind of like half and half, I feel I like. I just hope you're not a Green Bay Packer fan. Unfortunately, I am. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm a Chicago Bears fan. So. Oh, we, we can't be friends. <laughs> I know. We can't. But no, I mean, the Packers, I'm like, God, you guys are just making it real, real hard to root for you as the years go on. I'm like... Rogers, like, what are you doing? Like, come at, on. At least you hey. guys have had a decent quarterback, like, for what has it been, like, 30 years? Yeah. Our, our quarterback situation. I don't know anything about the Bears. We're oh. terrible. <laughs> Just, yeah, you should because we're your arch rival, but we're terrible. Just, we'll leave it at that. Yeah. Hopefully we found our I feel good about that then. Because we're pretty awful too. But to hear you say that, I'm like, okay, right. As long as we're better than the Bears, whatever. <laughs> There's levels to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> But I think it's it's interesting that you had that like your mom had a touch point to a place like the Philippines to that had that created enough of a concern in her to want to connect you to that because mm -hmm. the Philippines was one of those places. You know, we get asked the question all the time, like, where does trafficking happen? And our answer is everywhere. everywhere. So it, and that's true. It does happen everywhere. But the Philippines yeah philippines and mexico those are the two countries that people get trafficked into the most into the u.s that was like the statistic that i learned and i was like oh yeah that makes total sense i'm like not surprised by that but yeah the philippines is it's really out in the open there yeah in a lot of in a lot of asian countries actually it kind of is you know depending like where you are but yeah i remember i i like an article like popped up and it was it was like these uh this group of people made a did a rescue and it was i like it, it was like a is a brothel that pretty much it had like kids in it like babies yeah. like yeah. newborns and i i like remember like the images of like literally people carrying kids in like blankets like coming out like like infants you know, and I'm just like, oh, my God, like this is and it's all for video. It's all for production. It's all like for online. I'm like, oh, my God. And like, I think some like they some were from the Philippines, some were from like Australia. Like, oh, it was just. Yeah, it it, it gets really dark. It yeah. gets really dark Especially when it's like kids. I mean, when it happens to anybody, it's horrible. And like there's, there's no like worse than the other. But like for me, when it's about children, I have such a visceral reaction yeah. and i don't know why but i think it's maybe because i have siblings but i i i just when i love children so much like whenever it's something about kids i'm like oh my god 
I want like I just I literally want to like punch a wall like it makes me so angry and yeah that's like one of my favorite organizations is um child rescue coalition because they focus mainly on children and they created like a technology that tracks like the ip address of someone who's buying or trading or selling like um child sex abuse material and they like they like because they're like they like broke down the different like age groups Mm -hmm. um but they like they arrest people all the time like all over the world um and it's just cool yeah it's crazy i'm doing a film right now i'm doing my first narrative feature film on a story of trafficking in cambodia and the the main antagonist figure was this guy who's american expat retired marine who was over there and and just acquiring um young girls uh to you know like work in his house and and the idea was he was going to put them in school but he would literally buy them from parents and um and then you know was taking advantage of them obviously in all kinds of really really violent graphic ways which yeah. I, I won't get get into on this but um it gets it gets really dark it gets really twisted and in in like we were talking about earlier when you get into the psychology of it i mean he had i think deluded himself with his own cover narrative while he was trying to deceive these girls that it was somehow about love and it just really really like bizarre twisted yeah like i'm taking care of them yeah like i'm giving them a life that they would have never had before you know it's like that that i'm saving them mentality right and 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 he was using pornography to groom. train them to groom them into here's you know what you need to do if you to really love me and mm. it was just so twisted so i have like goosebumps i just literally got goosebumps my oh. hairs are like standing up oh i'm really excited about turning you know making this film just to continue to help raise awareness for people um that don't realize that you know not only is trafficking going on but it's, it's happening among really young children in a lot of cases that people just can't even wrap their minds around. I watched a a video on Blake Lively. She spoke for Child Rescue Coalition and she is telling the story about when she spoke to them, she asked them how young are these kids in these videos? And she said, uh, they told her that um, the umbilical cord would still be attached. And I heard that and I was like, hold on, what the f- did they just say? And I literally rewinded it and I listened to it again and I was like, the umbilical cord is still attached. That's insane. I was like, that's just, it's a whole nother level of evil. Like, I just didn't even, I didn't even know existed. I knew that there was evil, but like that, I was like, I did not think it could be that bad, you know? Yeah, it gets really it dark gets when so you dark. when you go down that rabbit hole. I'm curious on the subject of pornography, um, your mm. your take on the connection between pornography and sex trafficking, because we've spent a lot of time these past number of years focusing on on that connection and just the way pornography is being used to exploit people. Mm-hmm. And um, we're currently releasing um, a docu-series uh, on, that's basically an expose of the porn industry. And, um, yeah, I'm just curious your take on that subject because it's a pretty, I know it's a oh. controversial subject matter. Oh, yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> so my, I'll start with my personal experience. Of course, when I was a teenager and I was learning about my body and everything, yes, I did watch, you know, and I wasn't watching anything crazy. But, you know, just like I feel like most people when they're young, they get interested and it's such it's such a thing that society is obsessed with. Like you hear about it all the time. Everyone's talking about porn. Everyone loves porn. Yeah. So, you know, the videos that I would watch, they weren't anything crazy. It was pretty normal, you know, but um, it would make me feel like shit. Mm. And it would make me feel like I hated the way that I looked. I would question my body. I and my relationship, like with my sex life, was like not 
healthy. Like it wasn't great. I didn't feel, I didn't feel like I was really connecting to my partner or whoever I was with. Like I just, I didn't feel right. And then I stopped and everything became lighter and everything, you know, like I, I didn't look at myself weird in the mirror. Like I wasn't comparing myself to this. My, you know, sex life was, was, uh, more connected and intimate and like, you know, there was, I actually had a connection with that person. Um, so that's, so I don't watch it because of that. Mm-hmm. Um, but with porn, it's most of the time it involves a minor. It's not, it doesn't have like policies and regulations. That's why Pornhub removed so many videos because they got in trouble because like you know they're saying oh this is a minor or a wife is claiming my husband raped me and took a video of it and now it's online and I can't do anything about it so Pornhub removed everything and my friends they texted me about it because they know how I feel and they were like oh like this is like good it's a win right and I was like I mean they kind of just deleted all the evidence you know (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> they kind of just, you know, removed all the evidence and there's not really any, it doesn't seem like, then you know, it's justice in the way of like, oh, those videos aren't online anymore, but, you know, there's like a true justice that was supposed to happen and it just all got, it all kind of got wiped and no one's really talking about that. Um, but they're mostly very violent. They're mostly not how normal sex goes. Uh, most of the time they involve a minor. Most of the time it's, um, the video is posted by somebody who didn't get permission. It's like, you know, there's videos, so many videos of people online that they're like, nope, that I did not give permission or I didn't even know that video was online. And in terms of the videos that are violent or, you know, the ones where it's like, oh, um, uh, daddy does this with stepdaughter, Mm -hmm. you know, or, you Mm -hmm. know, like those weird, role playing or like principal with student you know that sh- it's like when someone's watching these videos over and over and over again where do you think all that information is going to go and what do you think they're going to do with it right. you know when someone sees a violent act with sex and they're watching it over and over again they're going to think that that's okay and they're going to do it you know like traffickers and pimps and pedophiles they don't get like most of the time ideas out of nowhere. It's they see it and they're watching it over and over again. So it just kind of adds to the issue of what we're dealing with in terms of trafficking. Yeah. You the, know? Issue, the issue with Pornhub was, like you said, is just not knowing what is this. Mm-hmm. Because the, the the tricky thing about it is that there are, there are, uh, pornographic videos that play on the idea of somebody being young, young. barely legal, you know, for all intents and purposes, like a child, like young girl, you know, with teddy bear, you know, like that, they kind of like play on that language and that imagery. Right. But, but they're doing with 18 year old or above women. Mm-hmm. There's, there's those. Then there's people who are actually, making videos of minors and 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 with Pornhub since it was a user-based upload model that wasn't moderating the videos it was kind of like a free-for-all who can know who can know so I I think that just at like a very base level regardless of how one might feel about pornography uh at a very base ethical level you just have to go look there's no way to really even qualify who's who's in these videos and i just don't want to participate in that yeah i mean that you know because somebody might say well i don't really have an issue with the concept of pornography i don't really have an issue with you know two people having sex on camera that's kind of one argument you know that that somebody might have but but uh, but just move away from that from a second and look at what what actually exists on these sites. So that's that's what kind of brought about the trafficking hub campaign 
was the the effort to hold Pornhub and their parent company MindGeek accountable for hosting, distributing, profiting from videos of real abuse, minors, trafficking, child rape, on and on and on. And that's just... And Instagram lets them have an account. Like, there's... Pornhub literally has an Instagram account and it has it's verified and has like 10 million followers. I think they just got deleted though. Did they? Yeah. Wow. Instagram finally did something right. Yeah. <laughs> but I would always be... Yeah. I would always... It would baffle me because totally. I... Well, it took several years after they were after, already exposed yes like, hello uh, yes and it would baffle me whenever like i would get a report on like one of my photos and i would literally message instagram and be like you're really gonna report this photo of me where there's nothing crazy being shown maybe it's like you know a little sexy or something but like you're gonna report this photo of me meanwhile well, porn porn has-, has, has a verified account with 10 million followers and you're not doing anything about that. That's wild. I'm like, you maybe you need to like figure out which things are more important that you need to deal with, you know? Like That's totally. If they actually did take it down, that's great. We've done we've talked a lot on the connection between trafficking and porn. There's like five like primary connections. So I I don't want to get in into that on this conversation, but just to say, I just wanted to reflect on your description of of your experience um, watching porn as a teenager uh, and just the feeling that you had mm. and, and how that affected you. Because I do think aside from porn's connection to trafficking and like I said, some of the more deviant aspects of what was happening with Pornhub and, and all of that, the clearly, aside from the clearly black and white criminal elements of this, there's something odd about the voyeuristic nature of just you know essentially what porn has created is sort of like this almost like this global orgy it's like this, this <laughs> yeah. collective consciousness now that we're all surrounded by other people having sex with each other and and it's it's new to our generation it's weird and it's mm-hmm. odd and and i think that we're at this point where people from all kinds of backgrounds are now starting to be more honest and take an inventory for maybe, maybe this hasn't been the best experiment yeah. uh, for humankind and, and for relationships. And um, so I thought it was interesting, kind of just your own personal journey with that. Yeah. It broke my self-esteem. Uh, it, it really, it just had a negative effect on me entirely. And I think also, you know, I was trying like, because also out of my friends, I think, you know, I was the one that had the first experiences more like Mm -hmm. I was the one that had to educate my friends sometimes because we also didn't want to talk to our parents about it. And so I would have to like learn information, whether it was about sex or whether it's just like about our body, like, you know literally the stuff that's going on with us because they would be like, oh, this is happening. And I'm like, oh yeah, that's normal because it's this, 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 isn't this, you know? <laughs> but I was always kind of that friend. And then, so I think with like porn, I was just trying to, I guess, educate myself a little bit. Which There's was, a curiosity element there. Yeah, which yeah. was not the thing to do. Like, you know, I should have maybe read a book instead. <laughs> right. Well, I wish you know? <laughs> there was better outlets for education around yeah. these issues of gender and sexuality in, school, they don't in our really bodies. Teach you and, anything. Yeah. You know, no. it's just it's very very basic, yeah. which is and I don't really know how you can navigate that because I mean, I guess they just kind of have to be very basic about it, but maybe like from a parent point of view, it's maybe we should try to become more comfortable with holding a safe space for conversations like that. Totally. Um, but no, it, and shame it, it, free and shame free. And, yeah, but like no, just it, ask anything. Yeah. Yeah. But it completely had a negative effect on me and the way that I viewed myself and the way that I viewed sex. It was a complete negative effect. And I love that Billie Eilish like recently came out yeah. saying something about it. And I was like, oh my God, like, because people won't really talk about it, you know? And she's such a 
global star, you know, and someone at her caliber with the influence that she has, like to be able to say something like that, that can be a little controversial. Like I was very, very impressed by her being so honest about her experience with it because I was like, yeah, like kids need to hear that. Like, because it's also could be like, oh, well, this doesn't make me feel good, but you know, Jimmy and Johnny like it, so I should too. And right. then they keep doing it, but it's like, no, right. like not everyone likes it. <laughs> you don't have to like, you know, it's okay if it's affecting you negatively, it's okay to not watch it. It's okay to be different from everybody else. So, and because she's so young too, like she's like, I think like 20 or 21, like I think that has an even bigger impact on like totally. the younger generation. Cause everyone that's, you know, 13 to my age is listening to her music and is like following her. So, I mean, I listen to Millie right now. Right. So, yeah. yeah she, everyone she, she, does. Really, yeah. Really good music. Yeah. So I'm glad that more people are, are talking about this. I'm glad because that all these issues are connected, you know, it, and, and I think like we talked about earlier, some people that are more vulnerable are people that just don't even have an understanding of their own bodies and their sexuality and maybe just a little bit the part of the vulnerability is the naivety that's there. And so I, I just think that this whole larger conversation is is really important in light of the fact that of all the things that we're seeing happen with trafficking, with places like Pornhub and so on. So you were you're like up the road from us. So I was like, <laughs> come have a conversation yeah, with right? us. Let's talk about <laughs> this. And I I do just commend you so much for just yeah, using your influence and your platform to speak into these issues so thank you so much paris oh thank you thank you for having me you guys do really really great work um and i'm very appreciative to be connected to people like you just to speak more and spread awareness and um yeah thank you guys for everything that you do too because that's that's really driving the force you know <laughs> You can check out all our podcast episodes, articles, and films at ExodusCry.com and join the daily conversation by following Exodus Cry on all major social platforms.